Would you invest your entire nest egg of 500,000 US dollars into an unproven business? Well, today I want to introduce you to Steve Zhao. He's the CEO of Sandbox VR. He's created an interactive experience of virtual reality. It's literally a Star Trek holodeck where you can play different types of games from different genres and go on an adventure with your friends. He has gone from starting his company and doing extremely well to being hit by the pandemic to then having to file chapter 11 bankruptcy and then emerging out of all the tough times and raising $37 million. Now his company is thriving and opening up stores across the world. All right, let's dive into it. Yeah, you got Star Trek Discovery. That's like huge. That's so awesome. We we did. It just came about from, you know, how we position our product as the holiday. And we brought yeah. the team in, we tried it out. They're like, wow, it feels so real. And I get to physically interact with my friends and colleagues. And it's like, wouldn't it be great if we can actually build a Star Trek universe in this technology? But they were so very easy to work with. And I feel like we've done a pretty good job with the content. You get to utilize the phaser at Tricorder. You got to be inside the Star Trek universe and you get to beam into planets um, and you get to fight Klingons. Michael would love that. He's in part three. He's, he's in three. They just announced that. Yeah, they, they do have this brand Bible that we have to be, hear very strictly towards, you know, how to think through some of the technology. It has to be very authentic to the Star, Star Trek world. Oh, yeah, so is that, is that like limiting to you too? Like some of the things that maybe you want to do, like kill zombies or something like that, or like you can't do? or I think it's empowering because when you have a limited amount of things to work with, that's when created, you know, creativity happens. It's very hard sometimes to be creative and you have a blank canvas. I would rather take some limitation. It's like, how do you create something so compelling that no one would expect from this limitation. Yeah, well, yeah, there's so much, I guess, so much to draw from. The, like Star Trek goes so far back. If you had to create it from scratch, did you create, like, there's some other titles that you had there, right, that you had to create from scratch? Or are those from, like, the mind of Stephen Zhao, or is that, like... Started with uh, me and the team, and a lot of these experiences comes from, basically, us growing up. I grew up on Resident Evil, so a lot of the zombie experience that would mention had elements of things that we really enjoyed from Resident Evil. Generally, I think that's the art is, you know, you take concepts from different places and it kind of influence how you can shape them together. And the great thing about what we have is we literally created our own platform. So this platform that allows people to be in full body VR, we exclusively own that. So just imagine having a platform no one else having, being able to build a content you want to build on it. I love that. So I used to go to the arcade. I used to, we would go to the mall and I'd say, I'd ask my mom for quarters. And then did you do, did you do that when you were a kid? Did you go to the arcade? Oh yeah. Yeah. Growing up in San Francisco. Yeah. There, there are the arcades in Chinatown. I remember even going to one of Fisherman's Wharf. Back then, what was it? It was like Mortal Kombat, Street Fighter 2. Yeah. Those were the yep. days. Which one were you, were you both or were you a Street Fighter guy? Were you a Mortal Kombat guy or? I'm much better uh, at Street Fighter. Uh, oh, okay, okay, yeah. Yeah. What player were you? Uh, Zangief. Zangief, really? Yeah. Okay, I would have said like Ryan, Ryu or Ken or something for, for you. Me? Um. Yeah, I like, I mean, I like Ryu or Ken, sometimes Guile, but, but Zangief, I think, was a level of difficulty as a character because you had to do that 360 joystick move that I could never do for some reason. You must be really skilled. That's actually what attracted me was because he was a character not many people chooses. Therefore, not many people was able to fight such a character. Meaning that he probably doesn't have to be that good to be good. If you know what I mean, right? Mm -hmm. And over time, um, you just get naturally better at it. And yeah, and, and it's just like nothing brings more joy than doing a spinning power driver on other people. <laughs> It is that is isn't like an ultimate move. Like if you do that, then they're just like, oh man. And then you have to wait like five seconds for the Zangief to do the whole move. So you're just the other player just like waiting there. Oh, oh yeah, exactly. I could see the enjoyment on your face being Zangief. Yeah, and I think off the it's, move. it's everyone's competitive in their own ways. So for me back then, I used to play in an arcade quite a bit. So um, especially during high school, it was just like there was a local arcade with local folks there. There were some pretty good people. And it's like, okay, how do you play in a way that you can better, 
right? And it's, it's always ongoing because the better you get, the more they not adapt to you. And then you have to figure out other ways of counteracting them. Our guy, were you good in school? I would say not really. I was like <laughs> a, a B minus student kind of in high really? school and, and college. Yeah. Certainly you must've been good at math. Were you were just in San Francisco? I was pretty okay at math. Yeah. Compared to everybody else. Well, we had a lot of smart people. So I went to a magnet school called Lowell, which is very rigorous on the academics. That was the first time I felt pretty stupid. Everyone that came in here also had the same goal of trying to be very good at what they do in academic sense. So no, I didn't, I didn't feel really smart. I think Lowell was a very humbling experience. It, it taught some pretty good lessons. And, you know, I learned my computer science in Lowell. Did you go from public to magnet school or were you there the whole time? Yeah, I started out just public from, you know, elementary to middle to high school. So Lowell is, is still a public school, but then their admission policy was an entrance exam or a type of exam. Even college was a public university, UCSD. When you went to your high school, like, do you think it was good to be in a school where there's a lot of people that can compete with you? Was that like helpful? Would you have rather be like, go to a school that where you're the top dog? I thought it was, it could be very binary. I think it'd be very helpful for some folks that um, were able to build like, a good social play and was able to do relatively well and have a more balanced uh, study and outside curricular. Others that might get lost in the system, I would say would be a little bit harder, which I felt that way in Lowell, I'm a little bit lost in the system. I think it has a binary effect. Uh, in my opinion, that I see some people coming out of it pretty happy about it. Because you kind of measured on uh, one vertical, which is academics, right? And a lot of your you know, value is on that one vertical. If that's not the vertical for you, then it's like you feel like you don't belong. That's a tough thing about academic school. I think for me, I was lucky because in college was when you can have different verticals. It wasn't just engineering. I was able to eventually get into a fraternity that focuses on business, which was a very good uh, balance to the social balance to the academic balance. So that and that so that's where you kind of blossomed in in, in San Diego, UC UC San Diego. I would say so. Um, it, it was a very good place to just a lot of the learnings I had in San Diego I wasn't able to do in high school you get there's a lot of social outlets possible it's when I start learning how to party in San Diego you learn how to party I love it what, what do you mean by that oh how do you throw a, a good party how to get the drinks how do you mix drinks how do you invite folks and just generally how to also enjoy a good party did you change were you like pretty antisocial introverted before that in high school i have always been introverted i just think in college i learned how to express that better publicly because you kind of have to learn how to be in a social setting right and i think it gets difficult over time if you don't have that practice i certainly didn't have that much practice in high school but college was a very good place to press that and to in a way to kind of like fall on your face and get back up and people kind of say brush it off try again so college was good for me. Did you go to UC San Diego? You mentioned it's public. So I went to Cornell. I went there because there's a state school to it. So I grew mm -hmm. up in New York and the tuition was much cheaper for my parents. So that was the only school I applied to because it would be cheaper. Was that you know what? part of the I, reason? I think that's a great thing to, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, growing up in California is just very economical to choose a UT system. Yeah, I was fortunate that, you know, one of the UT was able to pick me, so given my uh, GPA wasn't that high. Were your, are your parents, I mean, you if you grew up in San Fran, where they, where, where they do? You don't mind me asking. Yeah, they, they ran a, a small business selling bags to uh, supermarkets and restaurants. Wow, that's... Uh... Really entrepreneurial and tough work. Yeah, it, it is. It is a grind. They ground. I, mean, I think it was like a year business before they sold it. Did you Did you have to work in the as a part of it, or I did. The summer summer vacation was you know off to a parent at the warehouse helping them with the inventory and something. When did you start? Like what age did you start doing that? Twelve. I was thirteen. Wow. So for me, like, for example, like when I watched my dad work like three jobs, I mean, he, he's a doctor, but people don't know that you don't start making money until you're like much older. As a doctor, he was always working. I didn't, I didn't know that. I thought as a doctor, you start up at a pretty good pace, you know, at a pretty good salary range. Yeah, well, he immigrated from the Philippines. So it was like, I think he was in residency forever, like 10 years of residency. But yeah, so to make up for that, he, he worked many jobs. And so I think he maybe had Sunday off. 
um, I mean, that was definitely very influential on me watching him like always come back from work and then go back to work or sometimes he just doesn't come home because he's on 24 hour shifts and all those things. Mm -hmm. And he had his own office. So then on Saturdays, he opened his own office. So I remember him like even like making, you know, putting together his own furniture for his office and everything. Um, was that must give you some sort of pressure too, right? That they, they sacrifice a lot for the kids. And that in a way, you feel a little bit pressure that you have to make their sacrifice worthwhile. I mean, do you get that? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I would probably even say, yeah, I did my time. You know, I went to, you know, went to college and then I got a job and then oh, I'm only transit. I transitioned into entertainment media because I was able to mm -hmm. get a, I got a job and then like moonlighted until I was like, oh, I can quit and then I can go for it, go for it. Now's the time I want to go for it, you know? So I actually, I mean, like acting, I gave up because I once I got to CNN, I was like, oh, this is great. And everyone's nice. And like, I'm learning a lot and it's in media. I get to have my own office and direct all the the anchors and work with them so looking back though you know if it's in your heart then you're like you never forgive yourself if you if you don't go for it so at that time i was like okay well i've, I've built up enough wealth to say okay now is the time to give it a try yeah i'd love to hear what you think i mean it's i, I always have to tell myself you know what i can always get a job if this doesn't work out i can always get a job and i have to remind myself that because that happens like all the time like that i could there's all these positions that I could do but I'm like oh, you know what I can, I can I can always get that job we'll do that later <laughs> so I tell myself the same thing it, it works right you know I think at the end of the day you only get a certain time to do a certain thing after that time it become much more difficult and I don't want to be in a place where I look back one day it's like man I wish I'd done that 10 20 years ago and just kind of live with that regret if I get a job and it's stable versus, you know, I do something, I fail. Like, what's that difference? The difference is, you know, maybe you get to buy a smaller house or you don't have a, a nice car or, you know, you might not get that upper management position, maybe a, a position down. Like, okay, like, would you like really care about not having like an extra car down the road? It's like, no, not really. But would you regret like, man, I really wish I had started a startup at and believe in this direction and then it turned out to be right why didn't i do that like 15 years ago so that's how i think about uh, some of these decisions minimizing regret it works it worked for the last couple of companies i started you invested five hundred thousand of your own money into let's say sandbox vr and to keep it going during the pandemic like how did you make that decision so the context was, you know, back in 2016, I started Sandbox VR. I raised maybe like $600,000 from a group of investors. Some of them are my friends. You know, it was doing pretty well, but the product we needed to build, which it just took a lot of time to get it right. And in 2017 was a very bad time to fundraise for VR because people were saying, oh, we, we don't know if this is right. It's ready yet. We call it the nuclear winter of VR. So I went back to investors. I pitched new investors. And everyone was like, you know, I don't think location-based VR, you know, really work. The only way to save it was to use my whole uh, nest egg, which was all the money I saved up the last like 15 years of working. I asked my friends, I asked my family about it, like, hey, what should I do? And they all said, just shut the company down. This is everything you saved up. And my grandma was like, you need a wife. What are you going to do with no money? I get it, right? I get it. It was, it was a very practical decision. But I think for me at that time was, I believe what we were, the product we were going to build was the right product. We felt like, you know, full body VR done our way was the answer. People are going to want this, but we just had a demo. We didn't have a full product yet. And so that was one part. I really believe in that. And I came from years of experience building games. And then I talked to my team and I said, hey, do you believe in it too? I just don't want to make sure that I'm the only one wanting this. Do you believe in this future? And it was a team of five people. And I said, yeah, you know, we feel like this could work, which was very important because I told them, I'm going to put my life saving in this company and you all have to work seven days a week for the next six months. That's the only way. And if any of you decide to say no, then I won't do this. They all said yes. So that was another thing. The team really bought into it. Um, but also a part of it was we also see other companies in location base that got more funding than we did. The best company at that time raised almost 50 times more money than we did. And some of the companies we thought was really crap raised at least five times, 10 times more money than we did. And a lot of these companies were in the U.S. and we were a Hong Kong startup. And that gets me angry. So I think a part of that has to do with that. I feel like it was a bit unjust 
Like I know we are seen through the lens of a non-US company and that is a disadvantage. The other part of me is like, you know, I just want to prove these people wrong. Our direction and our team in Hong Kong will be able to build something that is better than any of the other companies. And there goes my life savings. Like I almost want to cry, man. Because I, I imagine at that time, you must have cried. Like, I've been there. I remember taking all the money out and then transferring it. Even the bank, it was like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, let, let's just do it. Um, Holy shit, that's, a, that's amazing. You, had probably had the, you probably had it in stocks. You had to sell it and put it all in one thing and move it over. Oh, my gosh. It starts the clock. Um, you know, um, when that happened, I think it was, it was pretty emotional to make that a step. Especially, you know, all the people I cared about telling me, hey, just just don't do that. But once I did that, I told my team, okay, it's done now. The money is in the bank. Now we hustle. And so just, it was literally nonstop, seven days a week, or I think six months straight. Well, during that time, it was incredible the amount of stuff we could have got, you know, that we've gotten done. A team of five people, uh, me being a sixth person. And we launched the product in four months. And then when we launched it, Hong Kong is a bustling city with a lot of foot traffic. We could not afford that. We found a place with leaky pipes that no one goes to because there was a lot of gentlemen's club there, but the rent was super cheap. So we got that place, zero foot traffic. So that was our store. So we had to win with that store. And I looked at the amount of money we had and said, okay, I got enough rent for about three months. That's it. I need to be able to sell the story that this is a product people want in three months or we'll be done. And then I think when a store was launched, I think the team got very emotional that day because we done everything we can to launch a store, but we feel like this is almost like a swan song because there's a very high chance we're just going to fail. But let us fail in public. So that people, this is what we built. So we actually came into, it's like the Mongols. There's a story about how they, you know, want to conquer new land and they burn a ship behind them. Like there's a certain sense that they were, they might not live through this, right? But they just do it anyway. So that was how we felt like. That in essence, that emotion was like, all right, we done it. We proved it. We launched it, that we could do it. So let's just see what happens. Crazy thing was we didn't fail. Like we launched it. People in Hong Kong, they played it. They're like, how is this? Like, we're just so unique. You know, full body VR has never been done before. And we also give you this video that kind of captures you delivered on your iPhone or your Android. And they're playing this and, and it's so real to them. It doesn't even feel like a game. And it was very soon that when we launched that we sold over 100 days of tea, uh, in a row. Like morning to night, 100 days. And we were looking at the numbers. Like physical business that sells 100% of the time. That has never happened before. People were like skipping work. People were skipping flights. Celebrities were coming. That was like our first big moment. And pretty soon, you know, we went to investors again. And it's like, okay, let's look at the numbers. Look at our product. And then we raised the round. And I was still pissed off because we, what we tried to raise, not in Silicon Valley, was still like many fold less than the companies that went to Silicon Valley. So we're like, oh, you know what? This is what it is. You know, we're not a... U.S.-based company. This is the amount of money we raised. Basically, we've proven a product market fit and we raised $3 million. As a comparison, like some of these companies in the U.S., they were raising like $12 million, $30 million, $50 million. One of the companies didn't even have a product out yet. But we got $3 million. We survived. It was, a, it was a very short-lived celebration because we knew that we have a lot of work to do. So then comes the next step, which is what's next? We're like, screw this let's bring it to silicon valley let's play in their playing field so that was like the next step and it was interesting because we got a lot of journalists and even investor asking about us and we hear this often they would say where did you license your technology from is it from israel is it from us is it from china and we're like no we actually built this ourselves and i'm like what a team of hong kong a team of just five people you built this yourself we're like yeah, yeah, we did. And then they asked, what about the content? Where did you license it from? Is it from the U.S.? And we're like, no, because we had to build our own platform. Therefore, we had to build the content on top of it. And it was just very incredulous because it's almost like you have to kind of prove that you did it instead of, you know, the assumption was always otherwise. So yeah. we had to go through that phase of Wait, just like... You think you mean like you're Asian and they're thinking you copied it from somewhere else? Do, do you feel like they, because China is um, known for copying? Uh... Yeah, I think people might think that, but, you know, I just think without team size and having, you know, being a team in Hong Kong, generally, it's very hard to imagine that. I don't blame them. 
right? Because there's not many past experience, you know, examples of that. Uh, something that is brand new can be built to the team of five in Hong Kong. I just thought that was very eye-opening to, to have to, you know, go through that. We even had experience where, you know, we had one investor that really wanted us. And then his boss said no, because his boss said, it's just not possible for a team in Hong Kong to do that. Something is not right. He was very disappointed. Obviously, we were very disappointed. That was some of the things that we had to go through, that we realized that, man, there's actually a disadvantage of not being in Silicon Valley right, or being in other pockets of the world where you're given more of a benefit of the doubt. That was why it was so important for us to go to Silicon Valley. So, you know, we took that $3 million, we opened a, a, a property shop in Hong Kong, proved by economics, and we opened a property shop in Silicon Valley. But before that, we were, again, as a high-growth company, you run out of money very quickly, and $3 million doesn't last. You kind of imagine our competitor raised between like $12 to $50 million, right? Like you yeah. need a lot of money to build a physical product that does technology, that does content, that does retail. You know, before we launched in Silicon Valley, we done a roadshow again. Fortunately, I got a really good buddy of mine back in college helping me out. He moved from Silicon Valley to Hong Kong in CE. So he, he knows the ins and outs of fundraising. He knows how to position a product. So I got a lot of help from him. And honestly, mm-hmm. like where we are today is impossible with this. You know, but it was a very tough, you know, roadshow because you look at the landscape, we only raised three million. One other people raising multiple at that time we didn't have a location in the US, right? And still our team is in Hong Kong. So technology is built in Hong Kong, like that doesn't sound that nice. I remember fundraising across Hong Kong, uh, Shanghai, and Japan and meeting over 15 investors and literally getting rejected by all to do our series A. And then we're like crapped. We're going to go to Silicon Valley. This is it. If Silicon Valley doesn't work, the company's going to have to shut down again. It's a cash-heavy business. And then we went to Silicon Valley. In the beginning, before our store were open, we pitched. The great thing is Silicon Valley is a lot more open-minded. I think experience taught them that's very important. But we also got some pushback. It's like, well, you know, we've seen this space before. We've seen other competitors. You can only do so much. So there was still a disbelief that we have to push through. I think that's okay. But the moment they came in and they played our product, you know, we have investors telling us, I can't believe that's possible. And these were investors that, you know, invested in Oculus, one of the very first commercial hands. And we made it work. We done a road show. We got people very excited. You know, CE did his magic. And Dreesen, they're known for taking big bets. They saw us. They saw this company, this scrappy company in Hong Kong that was able to, you know, weather everything out and bring the product in Silicon Valley and was able to have a product that they felt and we felt was better than all the other competitors. They did our Series A. So we wrote them as a 0% chance because they never, like, led a consumer-facing startup in Asia before. We were the very first consumer-facing startup in Asia that they led. What was um, that day like when you got that check? The story goes that everyone tried it out and they were very excited. Andrew Chen was our investor. And the last thing he did was he flew to Vegas to try uh, one of our competitors. It was basically the biggest one in the U.S. that raised over around, I think, 20 to 50 million. I'm just throwing these numbers out, but it was a lot. And then they came back and Andrew, me and Siki, we went to in and out and he said, we want to invest in you. And this was midnight. We were eat, we had in and out for dinner. And he wrote on a napkin, he said a term that we're going to give you. It was bigger than anything that we ever seen before. You know, because you imagine we failed 50 times already. But right then and there, we just wanted to sign. And we're like, no, no, let's just hold off. Take a deep breath and think about it. So we had a walking circle. It's like, look, we're going to sign, but let's just be very clear. So we went back and then we modified the terms slightly. And they're like, fine. And then we signed on a napkin at in and out at midnight. And then that's when we knew that, wow, this is going to work. I I thought you would have been in like a boardroom, but you're at the in and out Holy cow. That's insane. Were you trying to keep your poker face? Were you like, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, that's pretty good. Uh, Let me think about it. (laughs) Well, now I'm not going to poker. So we were, they they can tell. You're just like, yeah. It's like the smile, the giddiness. You kind of imagine it's like we have two weeks of runway left. You know, at that time, we were running out on payroll. And I literally had to like put some of my personal cash saving to blow some of the payroll to get this done. This was how close we were to running out of money. And I, and I told like, you know, see, it's like, hey, this is the last time I'm using my personal bank account to float the company. I don't think we're going to be, I'm going to have enough to float as coming bigger. But that was basically it. We fundraised for four months, rejection after rejection. And then finally, one of the best VCs since 
colleagues said yes. Yeah, so getting that done, it was an incredible journey. Everything that we worked towards to get there. So it was great. Like, you know, it, it was like day and night. All of a sudden, being this company backed by NG, then, you know, it's, it's like the pictures coming back home to Hong Kong. And then everyone just sees you differently. You know, we have folks that are like, oh man, I wish I messaged you back then. And you, you get a lot of that. So things were going great. You know, we were growing, we we're hiring great talents. It was tough to scale out. You know, I learned a lot. We all learned a lot during that time. But the hardest thing was um, less than two years later, the pandemic came. So that was like, you know, we were thinking, okay, you know, we have the capital mode, we have the reputation mode, we have a lot of great packages, we had a great team. What can impact us, right? We have a really good product. The one thing was the Black Swan event, where literally 100% of our stores before we closed. Overnight, we lost 100% of our revenue. So that was like another chapter that we had to deal through. So it's like, oh man, we can't yeah. even catch a break. Well, you just put your soul into everything and then you think you're you're in a good position and then that's just i mean who who would have thought with the pandemic geez it just kind of like got you yeah. in the back or you know we were in such a disbelief that it was kind of funny it's like you know you just can't believe this is happening so we were trying to raise our series b i think things were going okay but one by one investors couldn't come because you know we were forced to shut down so when you're raising a new round you're also at a point where the company's also at a new inflection point you know you have new growth you have new metrics but you also have you know you're also running low on capital doing the whole startup venture route it's like the moment we're doing series b then it happened and we have about just two months of runway left and that was it. And then all of a sudden, all the stores had to be shut down. What could we do? We made some really tough call. The hardest thing was we built this great team, but within a, a month, less than that, within weeks, we laid off 80% of our team. We had no choice running out of money. Like de facto, it was just going to die. We don't know how long you know, we're going to have. It's just very difficult because we all want to continue to build this. And a lot of the folks that we let go, including a couple of the earliest people that have been with us, we just had to, um, in order to save the company, it was just no other way around it. Um, so that's the first thing we did. And then it was just figuring out what options we have to go forward from there. And I think it was during this time that we realized any misstep would have been the death of the company. But at the same time, it's like, well, if it's the death of the company, it creates a lot of clarity. We know exactly what we need to focus on to save the company. And we know exactly the outcomes we need to hit to save the company. And we're able to communicate that to all the stakeholders. Fortunately, I think a lot of people at that time were very understanding. They understand how difficult we were in our place. For most cases, they were supportive. So I think that's where it comes to have like great VCs to back you. Like entries and we were also backed by uh, Alibaba slash Gobi and Kraft. Like they all came in, they all like pitched in. And we were able to raise a bit of capital, weather it out. While doing that, like the team, you know, we all took huge pay cuts. Some of us were not even paid at all. For me, I wasn't paid for the first months, you know, during a pandemic. A couple of my teammates were uh, able to do the same. Others, def definitely those that have families, we wouldn't ask that of them. But we all took pay cuts. We all rotated because we just needed to survive. The only way to do that was the one thing that we were very hesitant to do, which was to enter bankruptcy. So in order to survive, we had to file Chapter 11. There was just no way around it because these stores were incurring rent. The landlord wouldn't be able to service us unless we entered Chapter 11. And we had to go through Chapter 11 in order to restructure our debt. So either we shut the company down and that's it, and we wind up, or we go through Chapter 11 and try to do what's right based on how we can survive. So you just imagine like for like 10 months of just going through that process, going through all the legal work going through all the negotiation. And then we were hopeful that maybe, you know, the pandemic was lesson didn't happen. The stores, especially in California, it was very difficult. A lot of them were just shut down for like almost a year with no revenue. And we try to do everything we can just to scrap by, you know, anything that we spend, anything over a hundred dollars, like, okay, let's try to make sure we need this. That was like how precise we have to be. And I just remembered, you know, we even had to start doing work for hire just so that we could scrap. And it was difficult because this time around, it wasn't because we needed to prove our product worked or not. We knew our product was good, but it was the pandemic. I had to weather it out. And that's what we did. 
every month with just saving money, seeing what we can do to earn a bit of money, looking for grants, anything to just get us by. But during that time, we also focused really precisely optimizing our business. Every facet you can imagine on how we build, on how we operate, on how our product operates, how do we maximize virality, how do we optimize marketing, how do we optimize our, our content? Because our belief is the moment that the world re uh, returns back to normal with the optimized business, things would do much better. And basically, I remember like from 2020, it was all dark. And in 2021, we heard about the vaccine and it's rolling out. And again, we were just months away from running out of capital. We went back to investors and said, we just need just one more chance. We need a little bit of more money to get us by just a few more months. Vaccine's coming out. We've done everything we think, uh, can to make this product even better than it's before. Economically, it's much stronger now. Investor says, okay, just a little bit more, just a few more months. And then things reopen in March 2021. And holy cow, our business just blew up. The moment it reopened, it was flooding in. People were coming in. We created such a great place for them. It was private experiences, the way we clean our product, the way we service them. Everything was just like much better than before. Because we uh, went, you know, went through chapter 11, we renegotiated everything. The leases were much more efficient. And all of a sudden, we have all these high margin you know, units operating. And it's like, wow, it, it was just like a curve. It just flew back up and we're like, wow, I'm glad we actually endured this. So, and that's basically how what happened was um, we just became a much more diligent, much more operationally. We've been, to, like all of us, all the executives just been through this really difficult time. So we're much more grounded now. The way we operate, the way we think, the way we think about capital. Everything is just more different. Last summer, we have uh, we went out to race again with the new traction that we did. It's like, we're out of pandemic. And, you know, we were just starting our race and, you know, Andreessen came in and said, you know, I think they looked at us through the lens of, you know, everything that we accomplished, everything that we've been through, but also the lens of if this was a brand new business, you know, would they invest in us? And when they look at the market, companies that raised $50 million, some of the other companies that were huge, most of them shut down already. They didn't survive the pandemic. And there was another one that barely operated. And it's like, wait a minute, I'll, you're the only guys left. Like, we're the only one that survived it. So if you bet on this sector, you bet on this future, you can only bet on sandbox. And that's what they did. They did our series B. And from there, and now it's like just capitalizing on that. Like we're just growing very responsibly. Every location we're opening, we're doing great, all profitable. You know, I just been back to the U.S. for a couple of weeks and I just went to one of the locations. It's, it's like, it's electrifying. You go there and you see like, of people are having a great time screaming and laughing and just just enjoying the moment and you're like wow we're very glad that we you know we stuck through and we fought through the pandemic what a journey wow the the people that supported you i mean you re you really know who your friends are you know um that is true yeah it's like when you're down those that really want to help you we're very grateful you know we also been in a situation where in the news where people say oh man sandbox and chapter 11 and we also know those that took that opportunity to step on us you know i mean it happens we're like okay we'll just write you on this as we scale up we'll know who you guys are you, you truly know who are there for you and those that yeah otherwise i like that write you on our list that sounds like michael jordan like you have this, you know, these people that have, it brings the fire just, out in you, right? It, it does. It does. I think it's just that competitiveness in my ways when, you know, starting with when I used to play in arcades and Street Fighter, I'm kind of building that, like, like, who are the people that you're friends with? Like, even in the arcades, like, you have your friend group and you have your, kind of like, your nemesis. They kind of translate to the business world, too. Were you always competitive as a kid, like, before that? Or did you become competitive? Like what I'm saying is, were you was it innately in you? Like when you know, even as like a five year old, or do you think that there's something in you that kind of turned the light switch on? Or it did not. I think it started in college. It started when when I feel like certain things should be right, and when other people say it's not correct, and it's for me to prove that this is correct. And so back in the college days, downloading games on the internet wasn't something people did. But I built games and I put my game on the internet. Just remember at that time, a lot of people said, oh yeah, this was never going to work. Who would use credit card to pay for anything? You know, games have to be on the physical product. You have to have a CD. No one plays anything digital. 
I'm like, no, I don't think that's true. I really don't think that's true. So it's these belief. It's like these really firm belief that I think it's worth fighting for. So it started with that. And then during college, I was able to actually build a couple games that actually ended up doing pretty well and kind of helping me pay for a part of my tuition. And that's when I realized, wait a minute, if I believe in certain things and it turns out to be true, it's very gratifying. And so that really stuck with me, you know, and how it kind of went to my first company, which was a game development company where people felt like, you know, games is fun and all, but can you really build a studio doing that? That's when I decided to go to Hong Kong. Um, I think I saved maybe 20,000. This was back in 2008. And then it grew to a team of 50 in Hong Kong. And then we sold tens of millions of copies through mobile and PC. And then when Sandbox started, you know, we felt like through immersion can happen. Because that's the best way to experience VR. It's not really just about VR. It's you create experience that feels like real life. And we realized you can't do that with just the headset alone, especially back then when it was just tethered to a computer, right? It needs to be free roam. You need to be able to track from your head down to your toe, right? And it has to be something social that you can play physically with your friends. Like, I believe in that. And because of that belief, like, I was able to commit a, a lot of my energy, throw away my life saving into it, rally my team to it, to do that. And it turned out to be correct. And then when a the pandemic came, what's that belief? It's like, could Sandbox be saved? I mean, we, we, we're talking about that. Like in my mind, it's like, you know, I was struggling with that. In the end of the day, it's like, look, we created a great product. Long as we can survive it, the pandemic, and, and there's a lot of things we can do much better. I knew there's a lot of things we can still optimize. We should come out better than before. So therefore, I made that commitment. I rallied the team, rallied the investors, the lenders, eventually the landlords, build a future. And fortunately, everything going on in the timing, it just worked out. So for me, the, comp the competitiveness is, you know, it's just chasing a truth. And I'm wrong, too. I'm wrong a lot of time. But certain times, there's certain truth that I feel like is really worth chasing because you truly believe in it. And that's where the, comp you know, competitive comes from. Even as there's naysayers, it's like, no, I think this should happen. And you to make it happen. I'm curious. We'll see if this if this is too much of a tangent, but do you have a, a spiritual uh, belief? I don't. I never thought too deeply about that. Are you guided by that? I am. I'm, I'm, I'm Christian, but, you know, I have my own set of beliefs of what that means, too, as well. And, and I'm just curious, you know, when you're when when things are tough, I think that's sometimes you really don't have control. And you've been through some really rough times. Mm -hmm. Like every, it seems like everything in your life has been like, you know, actually, and it's usually like that. It's like at the very end, at the very last moment where you think, okay, this is over, we're done. And you've actually even maybe even convinced yourself in your mind that you're going to move on, that you've given it all. And then at the end, you're, it's like, oh, you know, we're going to sign that check for you on a napkin at in and out when you have two weeks left of payroll. It's moments like those where some, I, I feel like, is this really, is this really just chance? I see what you mean. I, I guess I never attributed to something greater than myself or anything, you know, tangible in our world. I would have to say that it happened before. Therefore, there's a chance of happening in the future. In some way, it's probably, I just been used to that struggle. And I've seen that the struggle can be a fruition. And if you do it a couple of times, a few times, you start seeing patterns on how to go about it. There are certain ways on how to navigate. For me, like I'm not a navigate the business world, how to build stuff on how to get the outcome needed, the execution. And it's never, for me, it's never really a straight line. When everything is done, it's always branching path. I always have a lot of A-B scenarios. So, you know, during the pandemic, like one of the scenarios was entering chapter 11. I had different scenarios that didn't require chapter 11, but right. it was just always like with a lot of other options. So, so in that sense, like there are different ways to get to a certain type of outcome. It's never a straight path. And I don't think it will ever be a straight path. And that is why, you know, when people kind of look back at it, it's like, how do we come to this conclusion? It's because you can never imagine at that moment, like back in 2020, that our direction was going to lead to what it is today. But we knew that there were like variables and controls we can play with, right? And it's always adapting, always iterating. That's why I believe in cadence of iteration. That's very important in what we do uh, in business and in art. But it got me out of it. I, I guess it's a very, for me, it felt like a very a scientific method in my sense of getting to it. And I guess that's why I never thought of it beyond just what is tangible on the outcome that we get. You know, you really believed in yourself 
not everyone is willing to do that, which I think is, is really interesting. I think this was great. But is there anything that you wanted to say though, or, or talk about, like, what do you think if there's an, let, let's say, would you say to somebody who's like at that last two weeks of payroll or they're at the end of they're they're ready to give up? What would you say to that person? I think it's important to find a couple people you really trust um, that you feel very comfortable talking to. I think the journey of the struggle is very difficult to hold in. And for me, you know, I, I do have my outlet. That's very helpful. Uh, so start with that first, because to go to such a high intense period, it's important to balance out the emotional side of it. That's one thing. And if you can, if you can balance your sleep, you know, your eating habit and maybe your workout habit, that's very helpful. You need to have that balance because everything you're going out is not balanced right now. So start with that. I would always encourage when you're kind of at these last phase under high stress, it's very, very important to take time away from a day-to-day -day work. You have to step away from yourself. Imagine you're kind of like another person looking into yourself and saying, am I doing this right? You always have to self-diagnose. That part is very important because that can lead to good decisions. And with good decisions and with good with good decisions and good ways of tackling something, which is eventually execution, can make or break any situation. So even nowadays, one of the things I learned during the pandemic is always to step away from time to time and reevaluate, you know, are we doing the right thing or not? For certain people, that can be talking to other people and just kind of bouncing ideas. Other people, it could be writing. Just kind of like let your thoughts take out into your Word doc and just analyze it. Is this right? Am I looking at the right thing? Is it the right priority? Um, are these the right people helping me out? Are there any blind side I'm missing? So that self-analysis can only happen if you're not doing day-to-day. -day. This is also why on a given week, I have my meetings usually on, on specific days and I have days where it's an empty calendar. I need it. I need it to step out and think through a lot of these things. And I can attribute like during the pandemic, we made a few really good decisions that you know got us out of it and i couldn't have done it without stepping out hey is this the right thing to do or not or talking to a few people to, to kind of bounce ideas around do you go like running or something or do you do some sort of ex form of exercise or i i jog a bit weight lift but that's about it i mean that certainly helps there's also i used to do breathing exercise in the morning the wim hof method that has been very helpful i know the wim hof method I, well, i've seen the, the youtube video how did you yeah, just stumble upon that, that or how did you get into that? I just stumbled upon it. I tried it out and it's like, wait a minute, this is helpful. And then I just in integrated it to my routine. Yeah, it, it's interesting because you're breathing a certain way. And you're... That's right. That's right. So you, you, you try to do that pretty often? I used to. It got me through some of the more difficult period back mm -hmm. in 2020, 2021. I mean, the company's in a different place right now. I think these things just come organically. It's like I needed to do that. Like I felt the immediate benefit. Like now stress is different. So I deal with it differently now. Yeah, I imagine like you have to shift your mindset. That, well, for me, at least, like I have a hard time spending money. And, you know, when you have a, a budget to make a movie, you have to, I actually have to tell myself, okay, we need to spend the money for this and it's worth it and all those things. I don't know if that, maybe that's a shift. You have, you have to have a shift in mindset now since you're in a growth phase. Which is a great place Absolutely. to be. <laughs> I think it's sort of like at different stages. I can speak for a startup. I'm not sure if that's something that also applied to your field, but at different stages, you kind of have to do different things. You have to realize what are the important things you have to do. So for us right now, it's like, right, we have more capital. But it's like, how do we spend it responsibly? Because sometimes you don't spend it, you might lose the money in the near term, not investing in certain things. And you have to think through what are those things. And you have to think, okay, I have capital. Do I solve this with capital or do I solve this with time? You know, there are different ways to solve it too. So I have to think through that as well. But, you know, definitely it was very different than the beginning of the pandemic where like it was helpful just to step back again to kind of realize, okay, where are we at now? What kind of CEO do I need to be? And how should I approach the company? And it will always be an iterative process. I, I one more question. Sorry. In the beginning, we talked about your vision for Sandbox VR, which was uh, you want to be the new movies. I mean, tell me about that. Because I, I, I feel like, well, movie theaters, they're in the US, they're so, there's so much space. No one's doing anything with them and it does need revamping. Yeah. I think what I'm trying to capture is, you know, I think in our younger days, when we used to go out to the theaters, you go out with your friends, our family. I mean, that, that gives me so much joy to do that. And I think a, a bit of that is lost now. You, you got a lot of great movies in your home. 
uh, people don't go out as much to the theaters. But what I want to create is essentially reason for people to go out again, you know, the friends and family, and just have a great time. And for us, it's creating these amazing social experiences that can get them to like laugh, curse, scream at one another, and capture it, and just have this memory. That's one I, one I want to create at scale. So for us, it's like, you know, we have five pieces of content. Like over time, we want to be able to release um, a new content you know, every week where people would chase out these new experiences. So we have 19 locations over the world right now. Like, why can't we get to a thousand one day so that there could be a sandbox VR, you know, in the neighborhood where they can bring uh, folks to go. So that, that is the future that we want to build. The very tangible future is something that like a daydreamer like myself really enjoy because it gets to be someone else. And we see hints that it's working.